At this point in the project, we are able to show our data in the table and delete something from the table. Well, I want to edit something from the table. I want that pencil to work. We need to create then an event handler for that pencil to work, and then a function to actually execute the deletion. Because this is another example of a button that doesn't exist at runtime, we need to do something like we did just a moment ago with the second parameter to the on method. But we then need to specify even deeper data here. We need to specify which of the pencils did we click on. If I were to add one more class, and I said again, eventually just put gibberish into this. I'm not going to take a lot of effort in putting in real classes. But how will it know which of the four pencils I clicked on? They're all set to the same class, if you recall. So therefore, we have, in this case, one of four rows of data to work with. So now we need to specify even more uh, detail of what we want to click on and what we're doing. So to remind you, if I go back to line 102, on line 102 or so is where I'm setting the last TD, the last cell of the row. Remember, TR starts the row, and I've got the first cell, the ID, the second cell, the name, the third cell, the instructor, the fourth cell, the pencil. Of every row of the fourth cell has that class. So we can target that pencil, any pencil, to be an actively clickable element. And then we have to specify it was this pencil in this row that we clicked on, therefore let us edit this row of data. I keep saying this. We have this keyword that we can use of this, which is literally this is the element we clicked on. This is the object we clicked on. So this is the one we're going to work with. Let's get back to our section where we've got our event handlers back on line 39 or so, 41 or so. This is where we've got our event handlers. Um, we're going to do something very similar as before, something dot on something. That's our basic syntax. Again, we're going to target the element that does exist first, which will be the pound div show again, that does exist at run at runtime. It will be on click again. And that automatically get, gets translated basically to a tap when it gets on a mobile device on tap. It just works. What we have to then say here in one more quotes is, well, what's the name of that class that we are outputting? I forgot its name already, but I think it's at a pencil or something. Yeah, BTN pencil. So dot BTN pencil. dot because it's a class, dot btn pencil. We're going to say start with the element that exists, and then you will find a class called btn pencil. That's how we can target a dynamic element. Well, next we've got the last parameter, the last argument, is a function. We might have, for example, function update. Don't write this yet. But we would have a function here. This will not fully work for us because we actually then need to pass a parameter of this. Don't write this yet either. We need to pass what is this object we're talking about. This is a more complete statement that we would have to add here. But I said previously, we cannot have parentheses at this point. It'll execute immediately. That's why we're not using parentheses up here or up here or up here. The syntax of how this we've been using so far does not require, does not allow a syntax. What we need to do is a little bit of a workaround. What we're going to first do is we're going to call an anonymous function here. And in this case, yes, we can say the uh, we can say the um, parentheses in this point. This is one of the cases where it's okay to do so. Within, then, these curly braces, then I will have function update class parentheses.
So in the event of a click of a particularly dynamically created class, run up and uh, run an anonymous function. In the anonymous function, we're going to call a named function, and then we can pass a an argument into the parentheses, which will be dollar parentheses again, and then this. This is the jQuery selector to select the particular element that I clicked on at this moment. We have plain old this for plain old JavaScript, but we have dollar this for jQuery, which will allow us to do more jQuery methods upon the object. So this, this right here means this pencil that we clicked on is the one that is active. So if I were to click on the third pencil, this is the one that internally in our code it knows. We're talking about the third pencil. If I click on the first pencil, it's the first pencil. But that's not enough yet. What I want to do is I want to target the ability to work with any of the elements in the whole row. Technically, this is saying this one pencil. I'm not really trying to edit the pencil. I'm just trying to make that pencil be active. But I want to work with all of the data in that row. So we have to do one more thing here. We have to say, in addition to this pencil, we'll have dot parent uh, method here as well. So it's really tricky here. Make sure you have the right parentheses and such. Curly braces here that encompass the anonymous function. There's an ending parentheses that is the whole dot on. Then we've got the opening and closing parentheses of update class. Then we've got an opening and closing parentheses of parent method dot is attached to this object, which is the current pencil we clicked on. So obviously it has to be very specifically typed like this. This is pretty advanced here. We're also doing chaining. We're attaching this method. We're chaining this method onto the object in question, the current pencil. We're passing that particular element into the function. We're passing the whole row of data, all of this, Overall, is we're selecting the whole row of data based on the particular pencil I clicked on. That will come into play because then we, we're going to want to change one of the cells of this row. I want to change the, the word English, or I want to change Smith, or I want to change CRN. I want to be, be able to change any of the items of this row in the table. And that's what this ultimately lets me select here the parent of the thing that I clicked on this pencil, the whole row. All right, so we will define what does function update class mean. Let's get back down to the, well, let's make a comment here before I forget. We'll say here, um, um, run and anonymous function passing in data of the whole row of the particular pencil that we clicked on. of the particular pencil clicked on. Okay, so now if we go back to the to the end after the end of our function delete, we will create a new function uh, 
update class. We will define what function update class is. And remember, we are passing the data of the row that we've clicked on. That whole row is an object because it has various cells and properties. So we're going to say a, a function update class uh, needs an argument of this obj, this object. We're passing in the whole row. We call it this row, whatever. But we're passing a big object this row of information. So we'll say function with an argument of, a, of an object. We assume it's a row from the table. A function to update an element in the row with an argument of an object, which is a row from the table. Big comment, but you can write as many comments as you want. But that's what this is doing here. It's a function which accepts an argument, which is a row from the table. We'll do a very basic console output here, if you're curious. Then we'll make it work properly. Uh, console out, go check out what this object is. Go check out what this OBJ is. Save it and run it. Uh, you should have something in your table. Click on any of those pencils. Check your console output and see what it tells you that this object is. It's going to be a big object with lots of little triangles to dig into because it's a whole row of data from the table. So I'll refresh that. I have classes to work with. I'm going to click uh, on the first row. It says, okay, you've got a table row in here. Previous object is something, and then the context is something. Or well, the context was that I had clicked on the button pencil. If I open that up on the first item, the very first row in there, I've got all of this data in here. Somewhere here, I'll probably see, here we go, inner HTML. So there's the inner HTML property, which is the whole row of data. Within each particular cell, I have this inner text. Here's my first cell of data, my second cell of data, my third cell of data, my fourth cell of data, cell of data, which is the pencil. So this is, this is an object that I'm passing in, and, and it's all... If I click on another one, the one at the bottom, or the one down here, 2040 BB. This is there's your row of data. What's actually in there is all of this stuff, and I see right there, it sees that we've got that cell, that cell, that cell, and that cell. So we're we're selecting the whole object once we once we click. The point of that is that from one of those cells, either cells 1, 2, or 3, I want to change one of those items. I had up here that if I wanted to delete a row of data, I have to type its CRN and then it deletes. Well, something similar to here, I'm, I want to have input boxes to delete um, to delete a, uh, a cell. And so those input boxes those input boxes I want um, I want to create at this point. In addition to having a box to delete a class, I want to then have the options to change those elements. So let's back up before we finish this function. I want to back up to line 109. 
back on the show table of classes. We, we made a, a line and then the spot to um, delete the class. I want to make another line and then a spot to be able to change those fields in the row. So we'll add to the string another horizontal rule. I'll put two of them just oops, just for um, to, to see. Now that's, that's not open and close HR, of course. That's two horizontal rules. And then string, add to the string again. My idea is that I want to have I want to have um, some input boxes right here, and then a button. Here I, I want to have the CRN, here I want to have the class, and here I want to have the instructor. So I want to do that. That's doable, of course, in HTML. But in order for me to get some of this alignment, um, I might want to eventually set it up with these elements. I want to have a left column and a right column. On the left column, I want to display the input boxes. On the right column, I want to display the button to change those. All around it, then I need some element to bind it all together. So we're going to create some divs a div to hold all of those elements, and then a div for a left column and a div for a right column, so that then I can nicely line up the left items and the right items. So this is going to be, this is getting back to here, this string that I'm trying to build, it's going to be a div. First of all, the whole div, as I showed, as I drew in that chart, um, will give this an ID. This is a div for two columns. This div will eventually be set up to have two columns. Then I've got another pair of divs. With an ID of left call. I guess we can call it div left call. I think I'll call it div left call. Just to be obvious that it's for a div. After that div, another div. This will be id div right call. So the picture that I drew a moment ago, here it is in HTML. Not as easy to visualize, but that's why I drew it first. In the green, I had a big container. That's my div to call container. Then inside, I've got a left column and then a right column. is going to be a, a really big line, so I can break this into multiple lines by what we've done before, which is close the div right there, space plus open the, I'm sorry, close the string right there, and then plus and then open the string again. And so that's a chunk right there, and we've got the, the rest. I'm going to break this to its next line like that. I want to do the same thing here. Uh, left call div, close the string, plus open the string. 
Next line. Just for the maybe the symmetry of it. At the end of the write call, I will close that string plus open the string and push that final div to its final line. So it's. We have got the opening div of two call, closing div of two call. Then I've got the left call opening and closing, the left call opening and closing, of course. So I wrote it all in one long line and we've practiced. This uh, makes more sense the more you do it. But hopefully the way I showed you here about opening and closing it at this point makes sense. In all of this, the point is that I'm trying to hope I'm trying to set up my inputs about what I'm trying to change on the table. Because um, at this point with our basic HTML, this is one of the best ways to do it. We have these input fields that we're about to create. We're gonna change the input field of a particular row that I clicked on. Okay, so back to our left call. On my left call, I will create a button. Oh, I drew it backwards. My, the left column is going to have my button. The right column is going to have my input fields. This uh, button will We'll say update class. This button will let you update a class. It'll have an ID, BTN update. Okay, um, then we've got the right column. The right column are, is going to have three input fields. The input fields for the CRN, for the class name, and the instructor's name. So we'll have an input of type text we can add a placeholder text one two three four X and an ID Field update CRN. Then we'll have an input field of type text for the class name and then one for the instructor. So, following here, another input, another type of text. placeholder this will be like an example of a class Android 1 and an ID a field update class
one more input field. Again, type text. Some sort of placeholder. And an ID, which will do field update inst. That's our instructor field. At this point, I think we can save it and run it. It doesn't work yet, but let's save it and run it to, to see it and to squash any bugs. But uh, if you show classes, uh, sh show classes, the table builds like before, and then the delete field builds like before, and then these input fields should now appear. We need to style them later. Let's at least see that it's supposed to work how I envision it. Let's see, refresh that, show classes, something like that, that's fine. Again, we'll deal with alignment and all of that later. Let's say I've got that. So it's supposed to show an update class button and then some fields where the user will be able to change the items from a particular row based on the pencil that they click on. It's a really long line, but hopefully you got it there. Okay, so uh, here, to delete the class before, you would have to manually type in the name of the class, which is a little safeguard so that we don't delete it on, per on, on accident. But here, I don't want to have to type in all of these elements to change an element. I want to be able to click the pencil and have these auto-populate based on the particular pencil I clicked on. Let me add one more here. Let's say 2040 CC is English. Let's say I misspelled that English 3. Instructor Alvarez. So I've got rows that I want to change. And we have the ability to update any of these records in pouch, of course. We need to technically provide the ID of what I'm trying to change. Just like I provided the ID, the underscore ID, of what I'm trying to delete. So if I provided 2040cc here and click update, it would update the other cells in that row. But this would require that I type it manually. I don't want to do that. I want to auto-populate these fields based on here. So if I misspell English and I click this pencil, those things will fill in here. Or I can simply fix English, properly spell it, and then update. That's my end result. So you have several little steps to build up to that. And so I want to automatically populate these fields. I can see that I can click the pencil and it sees the data. I then want to extract the relevant data of my third object and put it into these fields. So actually, the code that we're that we were starting to write over here of update class this should be function update class prep so let's change that it's it's not that we can update the class directly at this point we want to do a little prep first we want to extract the relevant data from the relevant row we want to prep that so that that data gets then put into those boxes on screen. Let's for let's therefore also back up to that original event handler where I had first called update class and also change that to update class prep. I was back online. 
42. We had uh, that div show on click button pencil update class prep. We're still going to call a function based on the particular row that I clicked on, but we're using that as a as preparation to actually update that row of data. So make sure that's function update class prep. And we saw that we're getting the whole row, this whole object. So what we need to do is parse that out. We need to separate the three relevant things of that row. What's in the CRN field, what's in the class field, what's in the instructor field. So we'll have a variable, which we'll, which we'll create via jQuery. We'll call it uh, temp CRN. That's equal to this object dot text. The dot text method strips away all of the uh, HTML and such of this object that we are currently uh, storing. And so we, we saw that over here, if you open it up your object and open it up your first row and all of that, uh, not right there, where do we see it? Uh, right here. We would see it right here that this particular object has all of these um, properties and one of them over here was text somewhere sizzle text somewhere right there, outer text basically. So um, all of that stripped down to basic elements of text. Well which one do we mean? Do we mean the first cell, the second cell, the third cell? So we have to be more specific here. From this object, I want the text, but of a particular cell. So before we finish with dot text, we're going to say dot find method dot text. We have a whole row of data to work with. We need to deal with a particular cell in that row. From that cell, then extract the text and store it in this variable. What we're trying to find in quotes here, TD, let's focus in on a particular cell, colon, EQ, parentheses. Let's focus on a particular cell, which happens to be the zero width cell. This is an array counting scheme. The zero width cell, the first cell, the second cell, the third cell. The zero width cell is where we're storing the CRN. So td colon equals zero is saying whatever is in this cell. If we had td equals one, give me the text of whatever is in this cell, the first cell, the index one cell. And then of course if we had two, then that means give me what's ever in the cell two, which is zero, one, two. What I'm doing is temporarily storing whatever row the user typed into that text. Comma. I also need to do that for dollar temp class equal to this object find the cell equal to that's a Q equal to one its text. Class two S's. But if you misspell it consistently, it's not a mistake. Now, okay, let's temporarily store whatever class is in the row. Which row? That's what this object is. Which cell? Oh, it's the second cell. Give me the text. Comma, temp, inst. Same thing from this object, which is the whole row of data, dot find, filter it out, find a cell which is equal to the second cell, its text. At that point, end of statement, semicolon. And 
and the point of that is you clicked on a pencil, you meant this data, there's the data, automatically put this information into those boxes that are waiting for you. Next line. And now we've got the field update CRN. Now that we've got what what is in that row, let's fill that let's populate those fields that are on screen. First of all, our field update CRN. So we're using the jQuery selector to select that empty field on stay on, on screen. We're saying dot val. That's the jQuery method to either check what is in that field or write something into the field. And what we're writing into it is dollar temp CRN. Take what the row is and then set it to the field. And then we'll do the same thing for the next field. Just pound field update class. That's dot val. We're putting in a temp class. And then the third one. Selecting the object um, field. Update inst dot val method temp inst. Save it and run it. Click on any one of those rows, and you should see that data then gets transferred down to those input boxes that are waiting for us that don't work just yet. But at least you click on a row, and it should take the data from that row and put it into those input boxes. So now if you click on any of these pencils, the fields down here, they're empty. If you click on a pencil, there it is. So then I can spell it properly. Update class still doesn't work, but at the least I'm able to click on a row and it'll populate that row so that eventually I can type English 1 and update it when it works. But here I'm able to at least populate those fields based on what's already existent. So if I have a brand new class, class 1, 2, 3, Math 1, Instructor Jones, whoops, I misspelled Jones. I want to fix that. Click on that. It will let me fix it in a moment. This is a lot to be typing so far. But this is what it look, should look like so far. Let me do a little pause at the moment. And then we'll... Um, let's pause a quick moment here. This, this is how it should work so far. It populates your fields. If it doesn't call me over, and it will actually get the button to work. We need a little help. Okay. Yes. Thirteen. Well, let me just look up over your code for a moment. Our lines may not match up the same.
So you see it's a bit of a setup to get this to work, and once again, this is an example of it looks so easy, you know, when, when someone else does it. When I've got this app, it's so easy. I tap this, it does that. Here, with us uh, building it with our own bare hands, you see this amount of effort that it, that it takes. But we're getting there. I'm seeing that I'm able to populate those fields. That's the point. Now that I've populated the fields, I want to make a change and click Update and it will update it in the, in the database and then on screen. But we're at least up to that point. So, back to the code. The whole point of function update class prep is to take the data of the particular row we clicked on, so that's the one we can work with. Um, we'll write the comment extract the first item, the first cell's text info from the whole row object, this object. This OBJ is the whole row. So we're saying, let's extract only the first cell, and then again, the second cell, the third cell and save it to temporary variables. And save to temporary variables. So that's what that uh, TD equals is doing. The first cell, second cell, third cell. Saving to variables. And then the next block of what's going on is set, set the on-screen inputs to the temporary, uh, to, the, to, to the data from the selected row. So we've populated, we've populated the cells, and then uh, on the next one, we will be the actual So the end of that is end function update class prep. Next is we have a, an a, the actual function of uh, function update class. This is the actual function that then takes the particular uniquely identified CRN and updates that record because every record in pouch is identified by the CRN. Well, I want function update class to fire or to be invoked via that button press, that button that's on the screen. This is update class. That update class will um, will work with whatever's been added to those fields. So. We need to create an event handler for that for that button. 
let's back up to where we've got our event handlers because we've got the button of the pencil to populate those fields. We'll need something very similar to that to actually update the class. So next line again with that particular div show that's already on screen. We have the on method, on click. We're going to deal again with a dynamic element. Uh, you should have pound btn update. Right? Isn't, that, isn't that what our update button is called? btn update. For this one we don't have to do anything fancy. We're not passing in extra data. The data is already there on screen, so we don't have to do that whole anonymous function thing. We will simply call update function update class. How does it know what? It will know which row because we assume here once we've got, once we've, uh, once the person has clicked the pencil, it will know which row right here because it gets populated. When you click update class, here's all the information we need for it to know which row. There is the possibility, of course, which we will address that, well, what if the person goes show class, does not type anything here, and then clicks update class. That'll definitely be an issue, because then it doesn't know which row. But by clicking the pencil, it will know which row, because we're supplying all that's necessary in order for us to edit a row. Wait, um, now you're thinking one more step ahead. If we're trying to update our classes, and that should have actually been class 2040B, okay, that is something that is a bigger problem because this class does not exist, and we're trying to update a class that doesn't exist. So we will get to that, but you're right. If we go that one step further, that one won't work, but everything else will so far. So we're assuming we're not going to change the CRM, but other things of it. So further here in our code, then okay. So we've got the event handler, um, and then this uh, this is defined here. Well, um, there's something that's been stored in those input boxes. That was the whole point of function update class prep. So now again, because these were local scope. Uh, variables we, we can't reuse them inside of uh, update class function unless we pass them in but we didn't do it that way so we'll have to one more time var um, create some variables to see what's in those uh, input boxes and uh, we could call them temp CRN again that would work because they they're in separate functions but I want to call them update CRN these are the updated versions of the CRN numbers and that's going to be pretty easy because there will be those elements on screen that at this point do exist when I click this button. Just pound update, uh, pound field, update CRN. It's val. This time I'm just requesting the value. I'm not changing the value like we did up there. Oops. No, not the end of line yet, comma, because we also need to do that for update uh, class. And that's also that's also pound field update class dot val pound update uh, inst equal to pound field update inst dot val and then end of line.
Okay, so this is trying to get the elements that are in the input box. We assume they're filled in because they clicked the pencil. Well, if they never clicked the pencil, these are these are empty. So um, we have the built-in uh, uh, error or result feedback from trying to delete or update a class. So we're going to rely on that for for error checking. Next line, I'm still inside function update class. In order for us to update an existing data uh, record in pouch, we need to again check, does that element exist first? If it does, then when we update it, we will add a new revision number. Right now, all of our data in our database has revision number one. It's the first version of the data. So we want to make a version two, a second change to one of our classes. So that's why Patch requires us check if the data exists first. If it does, then set it up to update existing data. If it doesn't exist, well, we're going to uh, not update anything because it doesn't exist. So we need to do db.get again. We need to first get we need to check if something exists in the database. What we're trying to update or trying to get is dollar update CRM. What the user typed, what's in that box, is um, what, what we're trying to, to update. Comma, that has an anonymous callback function of error or result. So I'm going to break those curly braces right there, and here we'll have our if-else. We've been doing if result continue, else it was an error. Um, that'll still work, but this time I want to just uh, flip it and do if error. Let's handle the error first. If there's an error, we'll handle that first, and then else will be the positive result. So it should be the same as before, but just to do it differently, we'll do it this way. If an error happens, I want to say the main idea is that um, make an alert, and the way that it cares most that um, that we're able to change anything is based on the underscore ID, which in our case is the CRN. So we will say um, we'll say warning new line the CRN. CRN, the CRN does not exist. For the moment else, uh, we will put in yes, update. just to check those two possibilities. So here I'm trying to say, uh, warning, the CRN, so uh, we'll have different ways to test these errors, but here, for some reason, let's say they put in gibberish. Let's update a class gibberish, but that class doesn't exist. So we'll get a pop-up. It'll say, warning, the CRN gibberish, what they wrote, does not exist. Or else, if there was no gibberish, the else portion happens, which will, for the moment, just be a little bit of basic console output to say yes, updated. Okay. 
let's see if I save and run that. The point is that if I type class, you know, zzz, update that pop-up warning, the class, the CRN zzz does not exist. If I'm trying to update class one, two, three, update, yes, updated. Well, I'm going to assume that these pencils are here for the for the user to click there to populate these for me so that then when they're going to change that to be English class 1 update class that will update. Uh, I don't want the user to type it manually. There's the pencil for that. If they do type in something that doesn't exist, let them know it doesn't exist. So that's what this code is doing. It first checks, it first gets, it checks, does that CRN exist? Then we actually have the, the real command to, to do the update. But let's do our second break to make sure that everything's working up to this point. It's uh, 8.24, we'll be back at 8.34. At, at this point it should work like this, and if not, call me over and we'll continue at 8.34.